morning, everybody. That's right, it's me. I am back. Kyle and I are back. Uh, you found us. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. It's me. It's Cam Hale, survivor of the COVID-19. And beside me is another COVID-19 survivor. Philly O'Fills. How's it going, everybody? Yes, the quarantine is over. It's done. We can actually do the podcast from the studio together. I know that the last episode, this audio quality oh, is garbage. Yeah. I apologize. We, like, we normally don't do the show that way. We, uh, I believe that when it comes to podcasting, it's always better if you're in the same room. Not just because the sound is better, but like sitting in a room talking to somebody, it's much easier we can it's see way them, right? Versus yeah. you, you accidentally, I think I'm done talking, but then Cam is still talking. You know what I mean? That, that little delay yeah. causes that a lot of problems. Now, we're also taking a risk. Cam did not get tested uh, again to see if nope. he doesn't have it anymore. Nope. Uh, so, but so I am taking a small bit of risk. But hey, look, folks, you're not going to live forever, right? If you're going to walk is, on, if you're going to walk on ice, you might as well dance, right? You got to die of something. So I am risking my life to do the show for y'all. He didn't act like it's a problem when he kissed me when he walked in. <laughs> I'm glad you're back. I'm glad you're feeling okay. How's how's your daughter? How's KK? She's good. Cynthia's good. I mean, my yeah. So tell everybody had, went all yeah, went like crazy. what happened. Like how? I mean, I know you kind of explained it. Yeah. But like, did you ever feel bad? Did you? Ever yeah, I did. But it was way early on, and uh, it was it was strange, man. It's a strange thinking back. It's just real weird. I didn't have it. Like I said, as bad as other people. My wife got not bad sick, but she was sick like flu sick. For a few days, but not long, but for a few days, my daughter was literally like unstoppable. So she's just stuffy nose and tired of being in the house. She's in the prime of her yeah. life. Though, oh, right? yeah. And then and then me, like I said, it was like a bad cold. I guess you could say the flu. I don't really know. Like I can. It's hard to speak on the flu because I, I've had it once back in the late 90s and it was in the summer. Like I caught the flu like in July. And other than that, I've never had it. So I don't, I'm not really, you know, you've heard us talk whenever we talk about being sick, but like being deathly ill with the flu, I've never had. So this was the first bout with that. But here's what's weird. It was never my breathing. Like I never had a problem, but maybe for like three days right, with yeah. a cough. And it affects everybody different. That's what's so strange. But I'm going to tell you, man, my taste is still like, it's all back again, but it's different like it, like when it went away, it's like it's went away, went away, and then it came back. It's like things don't taste like what I remember them tasting, mm. and I don't know what that is. I don't know if it's a physical change or if it was just my mind playing tricks on. I, I don't know. It's taste is a very strange sense that if you don't really appreciate it till you don't have it. And <laughs> now's the time you should be trying exotic food like balut and other things because you can't taste it. No, I can. I can taste perfect oh, you can now. now, but it doesn't. It just like I said, it's almost like it's tricking me. Like I'm like, is that really what lemonade tastes like? Well, you're a lot like me. Like I don't get sick very no. often. That's why when I was sick back in January, I knew something was up. You know, well, that like, was your first time. I mean, other than like ER visits, that was your first time in the hospital, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's Since I was thought. born, I mean, like you said, I've been to the ER for you yeah, know broken bones count. and stitches and stuff, but nothing. Nothing where I was sick, and that's why it stood out to me as, man, this is weird. I just don't understand how I was hunting in Arizona three or four days before this, and the next thing you know, I've got double pneumonia, blood infection. I still think that I probably had it. I'll tell you what freaks me out was thinking of that <clears throat> is that was the one thing in the back of my mind is I'm like, man, I got to really watch my breathing. I got to make sure that I'm like, because okay, most of my routine consisted of this, folks. Every morning I'd get up about 7.30, 7.45. I would get coffee, which means I would go into my kitchen, I would make coffee, I would grab my iPad, I would go on my front porch, and I would watch videos on YouTube or just something to be outside. Literally, I would drink two cups of coffee, then I would sit out there probably for three hours, and then I would leave there, and I would come in there, and I would get all of my shooting gear, and I would go outside, and I would shoot my bow for like two more hours or three hours. It was around a three hour shoot a day, usually. And I did that every day. You got kind of a glimpse of the retired life, even though you couldn't go anywhere. That's exactly what it was like. It was like being retired, but but just not having the want to to go anywhere, you know. But and but that's the hardest part is it's one thing to stay home when you want. It's another thing to stay home because you have to. Right. And um, yeah. I got we got lots of emails. Uh, oh, wishing yeah. Good health to you. And I'll tell you, I had to do one elite episode by myself. It was uh, it was different. It's odd when you don't have somebody to talk to and you just kind of do it by yourself. I don't know how people 
like Micah Hanks or Shannon LeGrow or other people, Jim Harold and stuff. They do that where it's solo. I'm so yeah. used to having a co-host yeah. that it's, it wasn't, I wouldn't say hard, but it's diffi- difficult because feeling. you constantly, you will like, what if I read a sighting or a story, you'll have your input, which will all of a sudden shake my mind into another th- idea mm-hmm. or something. You know what I mean? When you're by yourself, you, you don't have that. Yeah. So it's very different. So you're back. We're glad you're back. I'm glad to be back. Like uh, I really am super happy to be back, getting back to normal. Like yeah. it's, I can't wait. Um, so we're going to just do some crazy stories uh, now that we're both here in studio. I'm going to start out with a listener story. Check this out. It says this is a possible glimmer man or a shadow being. I also have an elite question. And Cam killed me in a dream. I'm sorry. It says evening, guys. Cam, I hope you and your family are on the mend. I've got a story for you about a glimmer man or shadow being. And I was hoping to get you your take. So, Cam, you got to pay attention. Lay it on me, dude. I'm down with it. In early March of 2020, I was sitting upright in my upstairs master bedroom, feeding my three-month-old daughter a bottle. The TV was off. It was dark outside and approximately 6.30 p.m. For purposes of the story, the layout of the room is important. From my seated position to my immediate right was my bathroom. Then a little up from the bathroom was a dresser with a mirror on it, and then up from that was an open door to the hallway. The bathroom light was on. My bedside table light was also on, and I could see a little bit into the hallway. Anyway, I was sitting there feeding my daughter and quietly enjoying a moment to myself while my wife and three-year-old were downstairs watching television. As I'm feeding her, I catch movement in the hallway outside of my bedroom. I saw it out of the corner of my eye and then pivoted my face to look at the movement. What I saw, I can't really explain, but the feeling in my chest was an immediate rush of anxiety. I saw a darkened but transparent torso shape with no legs and no head, and it was moving towards or into my bedroom. It looked like a shadow, but through a screen door. It didn't float, but shuffled as if it was walking, and the torso would have been about my height. I'm around 5'10". The shadow or glimmer crossed into the room and then in front of the mirror, but it cast no shadow and it did not reflect in the mirror. I watched it as it crossed into the light of the bathroom and then disappeared. My daughter's eyes flashed open, which was strange because she was still sleep eating. And I jumped up and ran the hell out of the room as fast as I could. If I hadn't been holding her, I would have left her on the bed. The being was not a shadow, I repeat. Not a shadow. No cars passed in front of the house, and my other child and wife were below me in the TV room. It could not have been something moving in front of the house, because the shape or shadow would have changed as it crossed the dividing wall between the hallway and the bedroom. After I changed changed my pants, I grabbed my baseball bat and went looking through every room in the house, but found nothing. Like my Louisville slugger would have been able to do anything about it anyways, that I felt like I had to try. I'm not a believer, but I'm not against the idea of other things beyond my scope of understanding being out there in the world. What the hell was that? I also have an elite question. If you join the elite group, will I have access to prior shows? I've listened to all the regular shows a couple of times. It's great. Lastly, Cam smothered me to death in a dream recently, and I took it as a sign to tell my story. So thanks, Cam, for that. <laughs> You guys are great, and I appreciate all you do. Stay safe, Chris. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Cam, so what is your thoughts on that? Uh, uh, he doesn't get into details about you killing him. Yeah, my bad. But I could definitely see that happening. Cam does not get along with humans, <laughs> most of them. <laughs> so I could see that. Uh, but he wants to know what you take is on this translucent torso. Was it a shadow being? You was know it what a it glimmer sounds man? Like. Was it a ghost? I mean, what was it? You remember in the, in the original movie, and it's been done in, a, in several movies, uh, but in the original Total Recall, you know how he's got that hologram on his wrist of himself. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. he'll throw it. You know how whenever sometimes he's walking off, or it's kind of it's almost like it's buffering, but it's not full. Yeah. So it's not all him, but it's moving like so it like flickers down to where it's like little pieces of him, and then it refills. That's what it sounded like. The way he was describing it was it was almost like a a hologram of something that was there. Yeah. So it makes me wonder when it comes to like ghosts, 
are they? Is the Shadow Man? Or are the the Hat Man? Are these merely ghosts? Because look, in the twenties and thirties, like most gentlemen wore fedoras, they wore hats, mm-hmm. they dressed mm-hmm. like that. So perhaps it's just a ghost. Often, when you read about sightings of a pterodactyl or a brontosaurus in the woods, uh, is that like a ghost of a brontosaurus or a ghost of a pterodactyl? Somehow, it's replaying itself. And if that's capable, if that's possible, does that happen all the time? Is Bigfoot nothing more than the ghostly image of a once upright walking hominid that no longer exists? I, I don't know. But it's it's very intriguing. And people claim that they're wide awake. I mean, this was at 630 at night. He was just chilling there, feeding his daughter a bottle. Yeah. I think it was very easily could have been a memory in that house. I would like to know what the history of right. that house is. And if it's brand new, if it's not, then what? Maybe something was connected to something you brought in. Maybe that's all it is. Or maybe it is. If, if we get we receive time slips and we've discuss time slips on this show if a time slip is possible then anywhere the veil is thin we don't know what's going to bleed over it you can't really describe it to people now that young people that never experienced it but you remember just like okay when you're you're driving and you're listening to a radio program and one song bleeds over from another program because it's the same thing now they're two separate stations but some and you're maybe they're completely two separate call numbers but for some reason, they're both on that same frequency because they're close. Why couldn't it be the same thing? And what I was talking about that people won't understand now is when I was going to use the idea of a television. Back in the day when you had an antenna, an actual physical where it had to pick up a signal, not necessarily digital. So a non-digital signal, they would bleed over. So it looks snowy. Then you might you know, see something right, else coming right. in trying to overlay. It's something like that. So, I mean, why couldn't it be? Yeah, that's that's exactly it's, that's wild. Yeah, very interesting story. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I would love to know more. Like I said about the house, something along those lines. Look, I have been inundated with this story from friends, uh, uh, other podcasters, uh, listeners. Everybody was sending me this. It comes from Phantoms and Monsters, folks. And what I'm about to read you, I think you're truly going to enjoy. Okay, and I think it's going to jog your memory on something. Here's the start of it. It says small hairy hominids observed by fossil hunters in West Texas flatlands. What? Yeah. Where? Where exactly in West Texas? We're going to talk around down in the near Fort Stockton. Oh, we drove through there. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It says a man and his daughter were fossil hunting in the flatlands east of the Davis Mountains in West Texas when they encountered four small hairy hominids. It says I recently received a telephone call from the witness R.I. who lives in West Texas. He and his daughter had an encounter with four small unknown hominids during a recent excursion in the second week of June of 2020. R.I. and his daughter share a hobby. They both enjoy searching for fossils, native arrowheads, and other artifacts. And it says on this particular day, they were searching an area approximately four miles south of Fort Stockton in the flatlands adjacent to the Davis Mountains. They'd been out here for a few hours when his daughter mentioned that something was following them. So R.I. turned around and he noticed four small, upright, hair-covered beings scattering as he looked in their direction. He was confused as to what these were. Now, he estimated them to be about 150 yards away and that they ranged from two to three foot in height. Well, so like Ewoks. Kinda, yeah. Said they had dark fur and reminded him of what people described as Bigfoot, but much smaller. For about an hour, these beings would gather back in a group and continue to follow R.I. and his daughter at a, as, a, as approximately or at approximately the same distance and, spa- and like the pace. He said each time that he would turn around and look, R.I. would turn around and look at them, that they would quickly scatter and attempt to hide. So R.I. asked if I thought that he should attempt to capture one. I tried to dissuade him from doing so, and he recommended that I try to have an investigator in the area talk to him first. And I have contacted an affiliate here of the Phantoms and Monsters research thing. It says R.I. has agreed to talk to the, to agreed to take them to the location. So he posts a picture of where Fort Stockton is, of course, right. and all that. So there are apparently four Ewok-sized creatures in the Fort Stockton area. So I wonder- milling around. Now, he, let me tell you this. Folks, there's nothing in the state of Texas that you're going to misidentify as two to three foot tall, tiny Bigfoot. No, absolutely not. We don't have anything that looks like that. 
like, like fort, it's not, not even, even close. Uh, let me describe the terrain. It, it's not like a huge forest. It's uh, <laughs> like rocks, yeah. uh, low bushes, cactus. It's beautiful country, sure, but it's very rough country. Imagine what you would when you think about like the desert areas of New Mexico, folks. That's what this whole area kind of looks like. The desert areas of, of Mexico itself, also. Oh yeah, it's a landscape photographer's dream at sunset. Yes. You know, oh. what I mean? but you won't. You don't want to be around when it's like noon, two well, o'clock, and you. Fossil hunters love it down there. I mean, also because things like we've talked about stay so well preserved in those areas I because agree. it's so dry, it's so hot, it's so it's just nothing that they stay. Everything stays so preserved. So fossil hunters have a chance of finding things like we've talked about. They were caves where they would find bows and arrows and all kinds of things still down in there that the old natives had left. So yeah, this is some rough, rugged, dry country that they're so again. Why would if you're that hairy, you're going to be burning up? Oh, right? yeah, so it's yeah. going to be awful, especially now. It wasn't as hot as it is now. I think you got to 103 today, but it was way less hot, way cooler a month ago. So, you know, but still down there, it's just brutal anyway. So, and like, my question always too is like when uh, Bigfoot or Sasquatch is seen in like desert areas or mm-hmm. like the Fort Stockton is like you got to think about it from a biological viewpoint, as in. What's what's sustaining those those creatures' lives? Like, what are they eating? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's not a lot. There's like maybe lizards, fossil hunters. It sounds like, uh, yeah, fossil hunters, uh, jackrabbits, birds. Uh, just well, you remember the story that we talked about, and that's what I was bringing up as the story I've told uh, that when I talked to Doc, and he finally shared everything with me about all the little people sightings, the, the tiny Native Americans. Yeah, and you remember he had he said that the last one that he had seen it had a rabbit with it. The little the little person, a little native, had a rabbit with it. So, like they had killed it, had it slung over. Them. That's right. Yeah. So, I'm thinking. Of course, this is a different thing. Like you're saying, this something that they would have to be able to live off lizards and snakes. I mean, the the only protein down there. And I'm not saying it's not possible because, no. like, grizzly bears are ginormous creatures, but they can literally live off just grubs, moths. Yeah, like small things you would think. Well, I think about coyotes. Coyotes are pretty good sized, and they live down there very well. They're plentiful down all that through that whole area. So there's plenty of rabbits and all that for them to eat. But I'm also worried about the the water. You consume that much protein, you're going to consume a lot of water. Yeah, yeah. And so something that size is going to have to drink even those two or three footers every day. I mean, you're going to be so wherever there's water, you want to. Now it's probably different up in the Pacific Northwest. It's very very wet. Right. But in the desert. Like even when they start talking about the deserts with the Yowies in Australia, set around water. You find water holes that are way back in the middle of nowhere. That's where you find things that you didn't know existed out there. Unless they're just absorbing moisture from eating cactus and stuff. Licking their eyes like that. Uh, <laughs> those chameleons do lick the moisture off their eyeballs. And I know when it's real bad is when you like see uh, down there, we'd see deer or you see javelina eating the prickly pear. That's when you know you're like, man, it must be bad. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, check this out. This is another story uh, about a potential hat man. This person wishes to remain anonymous, but check this out. It says, I want to tell you about when I first saw the shadow man. It was in the summer of 1966. I was sleeping in my parents' bedroom. I think because my dad was painting my bedroom at the time. And I was sleeping on an old rollaway bed. And from where the rollaway bed was situated, you could look out into the hallway and down the stairs. That's where I saw the shadow man. At least I think I did. I was having trouble falling asleep, as I always do, as I suffer from insomnia. So I'm laying there looking out into the hallway and down the stairs, and I see what looks like a hat forming above the stairs, because obvious I was obviously below them. But what I see, this head coming up with a hat on, like a fedora, and it's slow, real slow, coming up the stairs. I'm just looking at it thinking it was a trick of the light, but there was enough light that shone down into the hallways because my mother always had the night light that was on in the bathroom so that we could get to the bathroom, you know, whatever. Anyway, I'm watching this thing, and I'm not really sure what it is at the time. It's gliding up the stairs. It's not walking up the stairs. It's just kind of gliding up the stairs. And it looked, you know, I could see the head and then the shoulders and then the torso appear. And then that's when I started to cry. Not hysterically or anything like that, 
but I started to weep. And it seemed like I was weeping for a long, long time before my mom woke up. Anyways, while I was crying, I see this thing come up the stairs, all the way up the stairs now. It's on the floor, not the stairs now. It's about, I don't know, 15 feet away from where I am. And it's about that time my mom evidently heard me and picked me up and put me in her bed. Now, I know she saw it because she woke up my dad and together they searched the house. We lived in a nice part of Detroit. But anyway, there were still problems. They were kind of looking for someone who may have been broken in. That's why I say my mom saw it too. They searched the house and never found anything. All the windows and doors were locked just as we had left them the night before. Wow. So he sees this shadow hat man, you know, slowly emerge up the the flight of stairs, Mm -hmm. like gliding up, starts coming down the hallway towards him. And that's when his mom apparently like rescues him or her. And he knows that his mom saw it too because she woke up the father. They searched yeah. the house. So um, it, it was a long time ago. And you know how memory is. So if you're thinking back to something that happened in 1966, on one hand, I could say, well, maybe it was somebody that actually broke in your house, you know, and was somehow able to escape before your parents searched the house. Mm-hmm. And you just remember it or perceive it as like a shadow man or hat man. Or am I stupid? And yes. uh, if you saw something like that, and it was terrifying. It's burned in your memory. There's no way you would ever, ever forget about it. And you saw a hat man. I don't know. But the fact that that his parents, or her, I don't know why I keep saying him, why the parents saw it too, that freaks me out. I, I would be interested if, there, if his parents are st- his, if their parents are still alive, if, he sh- if they should ask them. Like, do you remember that time? Just to see what they say. I would. Yeah, I'd be very interested. To see, to get their full take on... What did you, how did you think I was acting? Like, did you, did you, th- you know what I mean? Like, did you really believe me? Did you, was you under the impression? Was there something that was found in the home that left me, that, that left you with the impression that somebody was here, that it wasn't just me? Maybe I didn't see what I thought I saw. Yeah. I mean, perhaps the parents had seen it before. Yeah. Or like I'm saying, it's like maybe there was something physically moved or knocked over in the window and they never knew, you know, that, oh yeah, there really was somebody who tried to break in. We just didn't want to tell you because we thought that would scare you worse than you imagining that you saw a hat man was knowing that somebody had tried to break in. Yeah. Because a lot of people keep quiet about a lot of things without realizing that it does more damage than bringing it out and talking about it. Oh, you're a hundred percent correct. I mean, a lot of people, in, maybe not in everything, but in this realm, in this sure. field of study, we need to be vocal and open about any and everything because we still have not learned anything really about what we should or, or about anything I guess that we should learn about this because people, uh, I remember having this kind of conversation. I remember if it was all fair or if we had recorded it with Joshua Cutchin is we had all discussed how much every little thing could mean something. So whenever you do have a sighting, you have to remember, you know, what was the temperature? What was the date? Go back and look for moon phases. What were the smells? What was this? What was that? I mean, it's kind of like a recipe. And so you have to kind of document that. And I think keeping quiet is bad. We need all the information we can get. Yeah, I don't remember how many. I mean, I couldn't even list how many times I've received a story where somebody saw something but didn't acknowledge it to Mm -hmm. their partner or a friend or a relative mentioned it too. Then they came for like, oh, I I saw it too. I didn't want to say anything. I thought I was the only one seeing it. I thought I was crazy. You know what I mean? Yes. I think that happens a lot. I do too. I think it happens an, an a huge amount where one won't tell it, you know, just glance, especially when it's fast. It's one thing when you spend a lot of time with them, but if it's quick, something runs across the road and you're like, what the hell was that? And while you're, if the other person don't say anything and neither one of you speak, you just act like it never happened. Yeah. And where if your partner goes, what the hell was that? Then you're like, I was thinking the same thing. I remember a couple of years ago, we even, uh, somebody that's very famous actually reached out to the show with a sighting. Uh, you remember, we're not supposed to reveal mm-hmm. who they were, but you know, what you're, like you're talking about, they had something, they saw something, but they can't come forward. It'll ruin their career. It will, you know, then you'd be forever, make some problems. <laughs> you'd be forever remembered as the crazy person, even yeah. though they saw something that it sounds crazy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I think podcasts like ours and other ones are very important for people to come up. It's a great place to share yes. without the fear of being judged. Right. 
I think you're 100 percent correct. I think everybody, when you find the podcast that you connect to, and you've had to sh- share it with them. Yeah, absolutely. Get it out there. At least other people hear it. Or if you've read books and you're like, dude, I've had this, Joshua, or anybody, anybody that's doing it, and you've had that, send it to them. I got to digging around after that whole uh, West Texas little Bigfoot thing, and I got to looking for more tiny Bigfoot encounters or dwarf Bigfoot encounters. And there was a few I found. This one actually happened a while back, and I think we may have covered some of these a long time ago, but I'm going to bring them back up real quick because they're from Cryptozoology News. Yeah, Philly, you heard me. Go ahead. Hamblin County, Tennessee, in eastern Tennessee, a woman said that she came face-to-face with a miniature version of Bigfoot. Says Leslie said that she and her husband were in a cave located inside their property when they spotted this creature. She said, we rediscovered the cave six years ago, and it has many unexplored chambers still. Now, she was telling this to the Crypto Crew founder, Thomas Markham, which is a paranormal research group. Now, apparently, this is what went down, that the husband pointed out the strange creature. Leslie decided to go down and take a closer look, and what she found attached to the cave wall sent her running out of there screaming. What was it? Listen, I remember this now. It says that we both froze in a shocked state and look at each, looked at each other before she ran off. She said it stood less than two feet, or I stood less than two feet face to face from it, and I think it was as scared as I was. It was a four foot long, four legged creature with a hairless human face, brown eyes, and the rest of the body was covered in brown hair. What it sounds like is it could have easily been a uh, a Bigfoot, like a baby or a dwarf, down <laughs> on all fours, easily. It's a four footer. We're not talking about something huge. Right, Two four foot long. Foot. Yeah, but would you say long if it was on all fours? Like, how do you say a dog? I don't know what I would say. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I would be just out of there. She, now, listen, this hairy Jimmykin looking thing, right, is walking around inside this cavern. But you're gonna like this even better. It can climb cave walls and freeze in place. No, well, I don't like that. Hell, we can all freeze in place. We I all can just stop moving. Just stop moving. Look, everybody, right now. See, we all just froze in place. Easy that is. Says the species could be a cousin of Bigfoot, but smaller. It had short legs, heavy paws with claws that are flattened on one end. She goes on to say, a lot like a fisher's body with a human white man's face. What the heck does that mean? I don't know, but she <laughs> believes the animal was a young male with clean toenails and no smell from it. So its front claws were clean. And it didn't reek, so apparently this woman is a Jimmykin specialist in the caves of Tennessee. She knows that the males often stink, not the females. That's, I mean, she go. It, now it's documented here. It goes on to say that she claims that inside the cave she found what appears to be a 16th century document written in Old Germanic by Italian explorer uh, Vespucci. <laughs> wow. It's a good source. It has the exact plate showing this animal with a human face. So apparently written on here, she claims that she found uh, 16th century Germanic writing by an Italian, Vespucci. Yeah, so it's like yeah. the Jim McKinn's, like birth certificate where yeah. you can see who sired it, uh, you know, like the papers. When you get like a, a AKC pup. There you go. This thing's, this is a papered Jim McKinn. A papered Jim McKinn that shows you its bloodline. A dwarf big feats. But that's not it. Now you'll remember this when I tell you about it. The dwarf Bigfoot with predator-like cloaking ability caught on camera. Okay. Remember that one? Yeah, I've seen several of these. All right. It says, Barbara Shoup is an independent researcher dedicated to Bigfooting. Had her dog, Gabby, was around Mount Rainier with some members of the group doing a tour of their favorite tree structures when they came upon this creature. It says, Claudia and I saw a black creature pop up and run, and the animal was described as having a domed head and no neck. Now, she goes on to explain that it had very muscular shoulders and moved extremely fast. And it was caught on camera. But when they played it back, all that could be seen was a translucent anomaly. Mm. She says, I knew the camera was on and aimed in the general direction where the creature first appeared. The problem is what was captured on camera is not what we saw. The 40 seconds of video shows Shoop and a group of people walking in the woods as they talk to each other. What the heck was that? Did you see that? A surprised shoop suddenly says, and then she noticed something moving in the background, says something black and close to the ground took off. And she goes on to say that what she saw through the lens, the translucent shape, 
is similar to the alien from the movie Predator as it ran through the vegetation. Wow. So I, I mean, that's you. not a new thing. I no. have over the years, <clears throat> excuse me. You've heard of Bigfoot having the ability to cloak itself. Yes. You've heard Bigfoot in conjunction with strange glowing orbs or UFOs, uh, that Bigfoot is interdimensional, things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying they're wrong. Uh, Bigfoot has the ability to use infrasound. You've heard all of these things. Yes. Maybe the Glimmer Man is Bigfoot able to cloak itself. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure. Well, it's wild that it can cloak itself to the camera, but it can't cloak itself to the naked eye. Whereas all the others that we've seen cloaked itself to the naked eye. That's true. That's very, very odd, right? Something with the camera. I remember a long time ago, uh, a friend of mine named Brandy had a camcorder and it had like some kind of nighttime setting. And for whatever reason, it could like see through your clothes, but only at night and only on that one setting. Oh, like with the heat signature or something? Something it? about it. So like maybe there's something in that particular camera. So was they you using that camera to film genitals? It wasn't my, It wasn't my camera. But did you borrow said camera no, for genital filming? I, I probably wanted to. Were you but trying I, to film her happened. nipples? <laughs> no, we were filming other people at the sure like party. Were. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> I know exactly which brandy you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. Uh, yet again, another one we really can't talk about. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I'm saying? Like there was, So there was something about that particular camera that was yeah, you were changing the people's. image. So I wonder if this camera, that's why it looks different through the camera than it does. Looks like nipples. The naked eye. I mean, much like when you take a photograph, uh, they always warn you to make sure you look at the histogram because on the back of yep. the LCD on your camera, it might look like you got you nailed the photo, right? It's perfect. Everything's sharp. And then when you get back to home, you put it in your Lightroom and you're like, ah, crap. <laughs> So, but you know what I'm saying? Because so there's you a laugh difference. because you've done it. Oh, a, a hundred <laughs> times. Over. I don't know why when I get on the field, I'm like, eh, I nailed it. I don't need the histogram. I understand the the focusing triangle. Perfectly. I'm going to tell you something too. <laughs> yeah, this is how stupid I am. Is you'll do it a few times, and then you're like, yeah, I got it now. I, I, that's that's <laughs> that's me right there all and the then time. You come back and you're like, yeah, I don't got it. I guess I got to drive back out there and take that again. You're like, how did I miss focus? How did I not pull that on there? <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm wondering if it's just. The explanation to this, not it, what it was. Yeah. But the reason it looked different is just because the, the It very possibly could. I think back to, uh, like we had discussed on uh, the missing 411 hunters, when she tried to take it with her phone and it had physically changed too. And it was still something clear. You know, it was a uh, a predator-like cloaked being. Uh, yeah. Had seen yeah. We had talked about that. Yeah. Um, but I think that was a little bit different because I think that was something that the camera wasn't even supposed to be able to do. Yeah. yeah it wasn't supposed to be able to do it. Uh, I've got another one here that I want to run past yet because I had an idea while I was reading these and then you bringing this up too. So this is going to work well. But here's another one. There was a dwarf Bigfoot spotted in Los Angeles, folks. 32-year-old uh, uh, Kaczynski, C. Kaczynski, that's right. Yep, C. Kaczynski. Uh, she said that she saw a small ape running. This has been a while back uh, in L.A. when she took a cab to her friend's house. She said, I come to L.A. once a year to visit an old college friend. After I got here, I got my luggage and got on a cab or got in a cab from my friend's home. And minutes before reaching her destination, she says the cab driver came to a sudden stop. She says, I asked the guy, what's up, you know? And he said, well, he had seen a little kid cross the road and he was afraid he was going to run over him. So I looked through the window and I see a three foot tall animal walking quite fast. It looked like a chimpanzee, but it had long hair, get this, and long floppy ears like a dog. Goes on to say, Kaczynski wanted to come out of the car to get a better look. And the cab driver said, no, says he got mad. He said he didn't care whatever the hell it was that he didn't have time for this crap. And he didn't want me to get hit by another car. So the thing kind of looked at me for a second and I saw those eyes and that they were human eyes and there wasn't any hair around the eye or the nose. And the mouth had a little more hair than the rest of the full thick black hair on the creature. So then it came to the other side of the road and climbed a palm tree and looked very scared. And I felt sad for it. I don't believe anybody was walking nearby. It was dark, but I was able to see the face. So it goes on that he wanted to, to park and stay there. And the cab driver was going to charge some ridiculous amount of money. wanting her to stay there. But it does sound like what this woman witnessed was some sort of primate. It doesn't... What she describes doesn't necessarily sound like a Bigfoot. No. Just because it gives, but the way it acted, to climb the tree, it's in the dark, it's just staring. 
But so what I got to thinking about when we first was discussing all these wild baby or dwarf cryptid hominid, you know, little baby, <laughs> little Bigfoots. With hungry eyes. With hungry eyes. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can think of. Looking me love looking across the road. Uh, what I can think about is this. What if this all goes back to an interview that we had done with uh, when you and I was talking to Adam, and you had brought up the fact that there were dwarves buried with giants in yes. North America. Yeah. Well, what if it's the same way? What if these hominids, these little ones, aren't necessarily little Bigfoot, but they are maybe another version or a subspecies or rather a uh, evolutionary step in Bigfoot. Like the O-ring pendic. Exactly. And here's why I say that. Maybe back in the day, there was a lot more food. There was a lot more everything. You could be a bigger Bigfoot. Now, I know this don't work quite this fast, folks, but just play along. And then fast forward to now, the big the big Bigfoot are still out there, that species, but there's not as many. Mm. But there's way more little ones. Now, I'm not saying they're little with giant feet. I'm saying they still like little feet. They're just a smaller version, a lot like Ewoks, but maybe yeah. they're a little more, they're faster. They're way easier to hide. I mean, everything would be different if it was three foot tall instead of eight foot tall. Yes, and let's just say that they are there and that they do help them out and that maybe those little ones are more of a uh, meerkat. You know how the meerkats stand up and there's always one looking out for the others? Yeah. Well, imagine the large Bigfoot are feeding up a valley half a mile, right? <laughs> yeah. And the smaller Bigfoot fan out further down the valley feeding. Okay. I got you. Yep. So they're spaced out, you know, every 50 yards or so, just a large group of feeding big feats. And when something spotted, the one in the farthest, wherever they spot, starts the call, kind of like a, a squirrel. And that call goes up to another call. And that's some of the strange whoop sounds you might hear. The wood knocking. Wood knocking you might hear is them passing along this information that they're citing to let you know, we see you. But I'm saying that the wood knocking might come from the bigger ones. The smaller ones might be making sounds that sound like animals or certain birds or certain whistles or certain anything. And they're passing that along the chain of command and they know to move out. Well, it would be real easy to walk past a little three footer hit up in the top of a tree in the dark while you're looking for Bigfoot or during the day. If he just gets still, you ain't going to know he's there. Right. And the big ones speak Japanese like and the, the samurais. Yeah, the Sierra sounds. That's wild. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then and then they move on and they move away and get away from it. And that little one can get down and circle around and go do whatever. And maybe they do get seen a little from time to time but that's why you never see them in like you never see them really interact is because it's all accidental sightings it's the big one wasn't away wasn't able to get away as fast maybe. right right i don't know i'm just throwing it out there it just it seems like the little ones could be helping the big ones it's maybe more theory. than we realize it's a good theory um uh, for whatever reason i've i've mentioned this numerous times on the air and i, I don't even have an explanation is when somebody has a sighting and they claim the thing is like 10 or 12 feet tall, for some reason, I don't I don't believe that as much as just like a normal six footer or even like a four footer. To me, that seems more believable than something 12 foot tall. I don't know why. I know why, because you you can't consciously let go of the fact that it's not a flesh and blood animal. Because you think of it the same way I am. I think of it as a flesh and blood animal that something that big can't eat, drink, scat, survive, move around, have a breeding population, and us not find it. Yeah, I would agree. So in order for that to happen, it has to be paranormal. Well, in order for it to be paranormal, it doesn't eat, drink, scat, and move around like we think it does. Mm. It's one of the, it's a double edged sword. It, you know what I mean? It's, yeah, no, I know. It's kind of hard to take part half of one and half of the other. It has to be a certain way. It either has to be all flesh and blood or no flesh and blood. <laughs> or a mixture of both. Well, and that mixture that makes it, it it's almost non-existent. It almost can't be that way. I agree. Check this out. I got another sighting uh, from a guy named Brad, or B-Rad as I like to call him, Word. Fr from Cambodia. And Whoa. he said he had a terrifying encounter one evening with his then girlfriend. It says, originally I'm from Oklahoma, but I'm retired. I moved to Cambodia with my family years ago, and I just want to tell you guys a quick story. About 42 years ago, my girlfriend was over, and from next door to my bedroom, you could see a staircase leading upstairs. There was a white wall. Well, in the middle of the night, I woke up, 
and I was paralyzed with fear. I'm not sure why. I couldn't move. I couldn't even scream. There was a black figure. You could see the head, the shoulders, and just a shape, and it was blacker than black. It was not against the wall. It was like 3D, and it was weaving back and forth very slowly. Well, the next morning, I woke up, and I was thinking, damn, that was strange, man. That was What a strange dream. I had a dream of seeing something in my house, and then my girlfriend goes, Brad, let's get out of here. I saw something last night, too. And I went, oh, here we go. You mean the black thing? She said, yeah. You saw it? I said, oh, yeah, I saw it. She goes, I couldn't move. I mean, and then for two people to have the same kind of dream, that's, well, I don't believe in coincidences. I told her to believe in the shadow people. And the feeling I got was that it was not friendly. It was evil. That's my story, and I swear to it. I mean, if she hadn't have said that, I probably would have forgot about it. We went to a local house of the shadow shop, and they said it could have been a banshee, but they didn't know. It was totally terrifying. The worst fear I've ever felt in my life, to be paralyzed like that. Wow. So, B-Rad, I mean, like people will talk about the, probably with sleep paralysis, but what's the chances of him and his girlfriend experiencing sleep paralysis at the same time, seeing the same dark figure in the bedroom? And I guess the locals, you know, it is Cambodia. So I guess they have different traditions, what they call a banshee, you know, they, all those places all over the world. Mm -hmm. They have different beliefs. Um, what was I just talking? I just received an email the other day where uh, a soldier uh, was talking about while he was in Afghanistan. Um, he was there and he, he has an obsession with dogs. I think the guy did a couple tours. I'll have to find it on a future show. But anyways, he said he really loved dogs and he can't help himself wherever he's at, no matter where he's at. If he sees a dog, he's like to whistle to it and have it come over and pet it. Mm -hmm. But he said while he was over there in Afghanistan, he would be doing that and all the locals would get onto him because they said, don't whistle. It, it'll it call the gin. Ooh. And so like, every, you know, everywhere you go throughout the world, they have different customs. So, you know, that's what made me think of when he talked about the locals there talking about the banshee in the house. Well, I know that Rosemary, Rosemary Ellen Galley uh, was doing some research into the gin being a possible explanation for Glimmer Man sightings. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, you know, I think, it, you look, everybody likes to give them fancy names or different names based on where they're at. We talk about that all the time with Sasquatch. Just like It's we, Faye. It, it could be. It could it's all be the same thing, right? Every, every bit of it could be the same yes. thing. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah, we don't that's have what, any clue. That's what makes it interesting. Uh, I think I've, me personally, the Fae stories and like Glimmer Man signings to me, that's my favorite compared to like oh, extraterrestrials yeah. or like I, we've often joked about, even with Nick Redfern before, is like the water creatures. I'm just, I just don't care about the water creatures. Well, like I Nessie definitely and stuff. don't because I'm not getting near the water, so they're not going to get No, no, me. no, no, no. Now you're talking about the ocean. Now that is, those are real creatures with real teeth. <laughs> so yes, I'm totally terrified of sharks. Yeah, I can't. I can't. How can you not be? I don't believe the people that are like, eh, I'm not tired of sharks. And the ocean I'm scared of sharks. Freaks me. The out. surfers. They're like, how would you like to do that? I'm like, no. It's a lot of fun. It's never as much fun as getting bitten in half. You know what's a lot more fun? <laughs> staying alive. Staying alive. Yeah, they're like, well, you know, you got a better chance of being struck by lightning than bit by a shark. Well, I don't want I'm that like, to happen either. Yeah, but there's a lot less people in the ocean. Yeah. I mean, the numbers might be different. <laughs> There's a lot more people on land. Yeah, this is true. You know what I'm saying? I'm not risking it. There's nothing. I mean, I love to snowboard. I like to ski. But if it happened a couple times a year where snowboarders were just grabbed by monsters in the by forest Yeti. and bit, at their head, yeah. bit their legs off, yeah, I'd give that up. I'd be like, no, I'm good. <laughs> it's not worth the risk. Here's my thing, man. Everybody's <laughs> like, it doesn't happen here that often. Yeah, but, but when it does... <laughs> So that's why they're, yeah, plane crashes don't happen that often either. But when it does, it's bad. Yeah. I'm and not going to eliminate that, that. Don't get on a plane, man. It's just real easy. Right. So I'm not getting in the ocean. I was just at home the other day and, you know, like these these infomercials and it starts playing like Sarah McLaughlin and it's showing these dogs like shivering yeah, yeah. and stuff. It was one just like that, but this one was for saving tigers. And instantly, no, I swear. I no. Swear, yes, it was to save the tiger fund or whatever. And I was like. These people, listen, you got to listen to the locals. I'm sure they don't want the tigers saved. Why do we uh, feel the need that every animal, even if it's horrible, 
needs to continue to live? I do not know. Like, don't you think the world would be a better place without tigers? <laughs> I'm not discussing anymore. We got a lot of hate the last time we discussed what <laughs> we saying. weren't here. They not eat children. They you. eat babies. They will eat your baby. <laughs> I have I have cats of my own. I have Hazel Cat. They will eat. I've got your baby. Gizmo, and now we've got Link, or we like to, I like to call him Conway Kitty. Conway Kitty. <laughs> yeah. And That's what they'll I'm bite screaming. you or scratch you for nothing. <laughs> for nothing. Now imagine if it weighed four hundred pounds. No, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I have a story here for you. <laughs> I've got a couple here for you, but this one really jumped out at me. All right. This is called the story of the bearded beings from near French Pyrenees in 1972. Oh, this sounds interesting. Cue the porno music. The witness was staying in his country house near the French Pyrenees and night had fallen after a day of rain when he heard outside a kind of splashing sound. So he went to his front steps and could see nothing. Uneasy, of course, about the noise, he moved out further into the darkness and noticed a luminous red sphere of three or four meters in diameter, uh, frozen, it says here, or a few dozen uh, meters away, just stuck up there in, the, in an adjacent field. It goes on to say that he felt a presence nearby. When he turned, he saw in the darkness three or four beings that terrified him. They were dressed in very dark one-piece jumpsuits. They were small in stature and of horrible countenance with bald plates and full beards. <laughs> yeah. Says, in this few seconds of this confrontation, the little being stood motionless, staring at the witness while he felt transfixed by their gaze. Thoroughly frightened, the witness turned on his heels and rushed back to his house where he seized and loaded his rifle. Returning to the same spot, he now saw the little beings moving quickly towards the red sphere at the other end of the field. He put his gun to his shoulder with the intention of firing at them, but suddenly found that he was unable to move and could not pull the trigger. The beings entered the object, which then took off silently at great speed, and when it had vanished, the witness recovered his movement and went back indoors, greatly agitated. He found himself sleepless for several nights and subsequently experienced various degrees of psycho psychological problems for which he needed treatment. <laughs> so the little bald bearded beings pretty much terrorized like this fella. Folk. To it, me, they sound like gnomes. Anytime I, I don't know why is it's probably only because they're little that I think of Faye and the gnomes and all that. But I mean, every time I think of the little small beings and then the little bitty and they see it like this where it doesn't sound like alien gray esque, where it sounds more like little beings, like yeah, a with beards, d- dwarves. I think of the ones with the little dwarf seen flying a little biplane. Yeah. So I'm like, well, how? And what about the? We did one. Oh gosh, I'm mighty. This is probably back several years. Uh, about the beings in the orbs, the little uh, dwarfs that look like the gnomes that flew in the orbs flying around. Yeah, yeah. So it just sounds like fey folk. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. More than extraterrestrial. It, yeah, it does. Well, and there's there's so many of them come from that area. And I tell you what's wild, Russia. There are a pile of crazy humanoid encounters that come from Russia. There's all kinds of crazy stories come from Russia. Russia's a wild place. It man. is. It's a ginormous place. It's wild. I think people don't realize, like when you when you look at a map, that it's not to scale. Like in reality, Russia is huge, <laughs> huge, huge. In like Western Russia, wait a minute, wait a minute. A map's not to scale. Yeah, no. Come on, now they even show you the scale down at the bottom of the yeah, map. I don't know how accurate that is. Here we go. Is it flat too? No, no. It's definitely a globe or sphere, or pear shaped. Yeah, or pe- yeah, oblong, <laughs> right? An o- oblong. Uh, yeah, I, I stopped getting my flat Earth checks uh, when COVID hit. So they I don't cut know. you out, huh? Yeah, I'm gonna start talking about it being round again. <laughs> I've got to, right? You're right. I have to deny them that. Man, I'm glad you're back in studio. Dude, I'm so glad, I'm glad to be to, done to get together. with all of this. Yes. I mean, I'm, it's just, it's different. It's, it's so not, different. I wish the world could just go back to being normal. Yeah. I think a lot of things are changing. I mean, we're on the, we're only about a month and a half away from school starting again, or well, when it's supposed to start. And I, I don't think it's going to happen. We've even gotten emails uh, from several people that go to school with Luke about how they're already forming these like homeschool groups where you got to sign up now and it'll be just like groups of 10 kids. And one of the teachers is just going to do the homeschooling from her house. 
I think that'll work for a boy like Luke, who's only eight, where the twins who just turned 13, yeah, they, they're all about the social life. Um, man. But it's so, it's, I'm just torn. I'm torn for so different, so many different ways because of the numbers you hear. And then you also hear that, well, this is a lied to, but this is real. And I'm pulled in so many directions that I don't know, you know, I'm, I don't have to worry about it so much. My daughter's in college, so she's doing most of all of her classes online anyway. Right. And so what little few that they had. So I really feel for the parents that have to make those decisions, whether they feel like they want to send their kids back or they don't, or there's, it's just, this has been something that I, I don't think any of us could have ever really understood the ramifications that would happen the way it is now of the way the doubt that's put in onto everybody. Right. And the, and the hardest part is it's I'm, I'm confident with the internet. It's not like when we were kids, you know, oh, yeah. that you can do lessons online and stuff. Yeah. But the problem is after I get home from work and then I have the podcast and then baseball and other things, I mean, I have to talk to my wife uh, <laughs> oh, at least once a day and, you know, hang out with the other people in the family and the cats and everything. I don't, on top of that also want to be a teacher. You know what I mean? Where yeah. I have to check the work or I have to help with the work. You know, the boys are getting up in age, so they're they're uh, doing algebra now, you know, and they, I've already t- made jokes about the new math. You know, dad, you're yeah. doing it wrong. I'm like, Well, I don't I don't even know that I can tutor them. And then what? Yeah. Now I got to go hire a tutor on top of the you know, the home education I'm talking about. It's it's not cheap. Yeah. I mean, it was like three or four hundred dollars a month per child. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to hire tutors. And is are they really? Learning anything? I I, I do well, like not you said, know. it gets to the p- deal of what's the point of me sending them to school? Yeah, if, if I'm going to have to do it all myself, we might as well just do it all ourselves. Well, I they mean, threw what's out the point, right? They they canceled the stars test and threw it out. Good. So that, well, I know. So that shows you. So why are we even depending on that for so long? Obviously, yeah. Yeah. you don't, right? It, this is showing a lot of holes in things that weren't necessary. It's like we found ways to to complicate our lives, right? And I'm like, we need to get back to. Growing gardens, knowing your neighbors, helping each other out. Love. That's what we need to get back to. I agree. I mean, straight up. Like, what is it John Coffey said? I even posted a thing about it. It's like, I'm just tired of people being mean to each other. Yeah. That's what I'm tired of. I hear you. I hear you. And speaking of love, I love the new show you recommended to me <laughs> the other day. Uh, Folks, I am caught up on all kinds <laughs> of stuff. I am eat up with shows. Yeah, I'm, I knew you would like this. I know it makes I'm, my heart happy to know I'm not the only crazy person that loves this show. I'm, I know I'm late to the party. Apparently this oh, has yeah. been out for years. I'm real late to it. <laughs> I, I just don't get a chance to watch any television. But Cam messaged me by text the other day. <laughs> He's like, hey, do you have Hulu? I'm like, yeah. He goes, you got to check out this show called What We Do in the Shadows. I was like, really? Okay, what's that about? He's like, just you can thank me later. So... All right. I know. did, and I, I signed yeah. off with, you're welcome. Yeah, <laughs> so I get to watch it, and it's hilarious. If you haven't watched it, you should check it out. It's not kid-friendly. It they is do, not kid-friendly, folks. They do a lot of cursing, and sexual windows. Not safe windows. for work. It's not safe for work. But if you're at home, and you like, the, you know, you like vampires, and you like to giggle, check out what we do in the shadows. I was actually messaging through Instagram with Sam Sheeran today. Did you, does he seen it? Oh, yeah, he loves it. All right, great. He's seen it all. And I was yeah. like, dude, I'm, I'm late to the party, but I love it. For those of you that haven't, that are uninitiated initiated and have no idea what we're talking about, <laughs> it was originally a movie uh, shot in New Zealand, I think, in 2015, I believe is when it was, or I forgot exactly I need when to try to find the movie, because I haven't seen that either. I haven't seen the movie, but it was originally a movie, and it was a documentary crew following around like three vampires in modern times, and it's real just silliness, right? Of but the like, silliness. is it like a, like a real people that believe they're vampires? No, 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 no. It's just like the TV series. Oh, it's series. a joke. Okay. It's just all a joke. It's I got all you. this crazy horror comedy stuff. Like, just, it's ridiculous. And so you jump forward into this, what we do in the shadows on Hulu. It's the same thing, except it takes place in Staten Island. There's four, and a couple of them are married. There's a man and a woman in there. One of them's an energy vampire <laughs> named Colin, and he's hilarious. The whole show, Laszlo is my favorite dude on the whole show, <laughs> just because he's preposterous. But, folks, if you haven't seen it, I urge you to watch it. And then I urge you, like I said, it's not, if you're easily offended, folks, and you don't like you don't like to have a good time. If you're some, <laughs> if you're one of those people that are against having fun, do not watch this show. Yeah. But if you're if you if you're down with the fun, which watch I think it. most people that listen to us are. Yeah, you need to watch it, and you can thank us later. Yeah, absolutely. I'll also, tell you. Wait before you go. I'll tell you something else. You remember a while back, I had talked about how I loved Midsummer Murders on on uh, Netflix, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, they took it off. 
So I couldn't watch it. Well, then I found it through the Roku, but then I found a little paid for thing called Acorn TV, which is all like British and Australian and like all, all the, the television shows that we don't get here right. that are like these. And I had found one from New Zealand. Now, you Kiwis know how to make a pretty jam up murder show. It's called Broken Wood Murders. And this is Broken like, Wood Mysteries. Maybe it's bro- oh, it's Broken Wood Mysteries. Is this like Masterpiece Theater? Like on no, PBS? no, dude, it's awesome. Really? I'm going to tell you, it's all each episode. Each season has four episodes. Each episode's an hour and a half long. Huh? Never. So they're heard like of little it. movies. Yeah, yeah. Man, I'm going to tell you, dude, they're fun. I'll have to. They're check fun it out. because here's why. Here's what I noticed. A lot of shows, and I'm sure it's this way around the world, but a lot of those crime shows where you're hunting for killers. It's very dark, you know, and it really, you know, and look, I'm all for it. Like Hannibal. I watched some of that series of Hannibal. It's dark. That's a dark series. It's okay, but after a while, it wears on your soul. You just I never watched that, and I never watched, what was it, Dexter, where he was like a serial I've watched killer. Dexter, yeah. I watched the first two seasons, then I bailed out. But like that one, it's kind of lighthearted, but it's dark also. This Broken Wood Mysteries is lighthearted. Like the whole thing, it's, it's like you would like it to be. Like, yeah, it's... It's dark because it's um, there's a murder takes place, but it's a lot, a, a lot lighter. It's not quite as heavy, if you will, with the way this show is shot. So it's a lot of fun. It's all it's not as campy as Midsummer, but it's pretty close. I got gotcha. you, but well, still not anywhere as good as what we do in the shadows. Well, uh, recommendations from the quarantine. That's what Cam had that's a lot right. of time to do. Yeah, awesome. I've got a ton of them. That's and books. I've got a ton of books that I can tell y'all to read too. Oh, check that out, Jack uh, Carr. All three of his books. If you're really into the any kind of military and revenge plots, now that we're going to go to dark, I don't want to watch it. I want to read about it. Read it. Read his three books. Uh, what is it? True Believer. The last one, Savage Son. What is the uh, Terminal Is that the guy that was like is the first one? Is that the guy that was like a Navy SEAL? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm familiar with his stuff. Well, if you have any stories or sightings. Please share them with me and Cam. Email the show at expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. You can call the show 817-945-3828. And you can follow the show on all forms of social media. Till next time, folks, be safe. Be careful. I'll talk to you later. Or we'll talk to you later. Word. I'm Kyle. He's Cam. Peace, y'all.